type of flying with aerial silks that was um, very dynamic. I started doing drops and flights and um, the, the goal was to create optical illusion. So the winch operator very much so became my partner in the act and it was really more of a duo than it was a solo. Uh, I did that act on Lanuba and Delirium and then on Zed we transitioned to automation and uh, pre-programmed cues where I learned an enormous amount. Uh, from there, I went on to Mystere um, and transitioned into acrobatic design a few years ago, which um, I wanna give a shout out to Brett Barrett who uh, helped me out with that. So um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much my, my career transition from artist in traditional circus to acrobatic designer for Cirque. And um, yeah, that's me. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Andy. Um, I uh, met Bill uh, in the late 90s when uh, his brother got upset with me and sent me down the street to work with him, uh, work, with, work with Bill. Um, and I don't blame Mike at all in that moment uh, of sending the green new guy down to work with Bill. <laughs> um, and I met Ginger a few years ago in Vegas through uh, mutual friends um, and I mutual good friends. I think we met at like a uh, barbecue somewhere. Um, so I, uh, I'm a circus rigger. I work at the New England Center for the Circus Arts currently, uh, which is um, a, a circus school here in Brattleboro, Vermont. I'm the rigger and facilities manager. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that we are running a circus school uh, right now during a pandemic. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of the work I do here, uh, teaching the next generation of uh, circus performers, aerialists about rigging and safety and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, keeping them safe from all the snow. <laughs> uh, before that, I lived in Las Vegas. I was uh, a rigger on a number of different shows there. Uh, uh, Cirque Soleil shows, the big spectacular shows that uh, you think of in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was a head rigger with Cirque du Soleil on a show called Kuza, which was under canvas. Uh, and I toured, was lucky enough to tour uh, three or four continents uh, with that show. Uh, worked with some fantastic artists, learned a lot of, re I learned how to do circus rigging well on that show. Uh, and before that, I was a entertainment rigger, theater rigger. I've uh, worked in a the music industry. I've done not a lot of arena rigging, but a fair bit of event rigging. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Ginger, unless you have anything else, I guess I'll get started with the... Uh... So uh, we really want to have a conversation with you guys. Uh, and Ginger and I have been having an ongoing conversation for years about how to work with each other, basically, like how riggers work with performers and how performers work with riggers and the challenges and the, the how rewarding it is. And uh, what we came up with for today was uh, a rough list of bullet points for takeaways about uh, the rigging and artist relationship. Um, shall we, I'm gonna figure out how to share my screen here. All right. So can everybody see that and still hear me? And... Yes. You're good. Thanks. Great. Um, this is the, f this phrase, rigging is trust, is something I've arrived at through, you know, 10 years of circus rigging. And the, it's not, intuitive, like rigging is shackles and wire rope and, uh, you know, uh, hanging people in the air. And it's what it, this, it's really not that. It is the ability to trust all of that. And that is the key thing that a rigger has to understand and to provide to his client. You know, whether that's the sound department or the acrobatic department, uh, 
is just a level of di different difficulty. Um, Ginger, you had a really interesting reaction to uh, this point in our dialogue. Um, what is rigging for you? Well, when you brought this up, it you're using rigging in terms of the verb, which um, is true. But then there's also uh, rigor. Just by being a rigger does not necessarily mean that you initially and instantly gain an artist's trust. So yes, rigging is it, the, the, the value that you're bringing is trust, but when an artist, at least in my experience, when I trust my rigger, my operator and the rigging team as a whole, I no longer think about the rigging team. So yes, in a way rigging is trust, but from my perspective, rigging is also the absence of thinking about rigging, which allows me to do my job better. And that's, I mean, and that's the point of what I do is allowing you to do your job uh, how you need to. Um, like nobody hangs the trust in the air just for the sake of having the trust in the air. Like rigging is always about serving the needs of other departments. And, you know, the, my job is to make sure that they don't have to think about, uh, you, Ginger, don't have to think about, is that okay up there? Um, When, so, yeah, yeah the, the trust that you provide to me based on the, the environment and the, the equipment being secure allows me to trust myself more. That's another part of it is like, um, it depends of course on the apparatus that the artist is on, but for example, on tissue, there is no additional safety line. There, there are a lot of open keys. There are a lot of things that can go, that I can do wrong that will affect me. So when I only have to consider my own personal mistakes, potential mistakes, uh, it, it creates a, a much better working environment for me. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the trust has to go both ways. Uh, I have to trust you to know what you're doing um, and to, you know, the risk is inherent in circus arts. So, what you're doing and entertaining people with your risk and your skill of, of doing that, um, you know, is meant to, it's meant to elicit an emotional response of, well, joy, but also like a little bit of fear, like, oh my gosh, she's so high. Uh, and how can she do that? Um, so we, as the technical people, we have to trust that you know what you're doing. Uh, so that building that trust is a two way street. Um, the other, the other thought I have about trust and rigging is that how do I know to trust, uh, a shackle or a carabiner or a piece of trust? Um, and well, the answer is it's made by quality people and it has a rating. Well, how do I know that all, I'm not a material scientist. I don't weld trust. How do I trust this stuff? Well, the simple answer for me is that someone that I trust told me that I can trust Crosby or Tomcat or, uh, uh, or Sapsis. So I buy all of my stuff from not just Sapsis, but a, a, I only buy it from vendors who are trustworthy. Um, and that's a personal relationship. Uh, so um, yeah, let's move on to the next one. Well, we just, just for all the aerialists here, you know, when you, when it, we're talking about trust and how it's a, it's a reciprocal relationship. When you come into a new gig, it's really important to establish uh, yourself as someone that takes your own personal uh, safety in a high regard, like walking in and doing your biggest tricks as if you're going to impress everybody doesn't really work. What you need to do at first is, is gain, um, gain their trust by showing that you, you get it. You're going to, do your drop slowly to make sure that your heights are good. You're going to get to know your space. You know what I mean? So just a tip to the aerialists. I know that that might be a bit redundant for the, the riggers here, but. Oh, I think it's more, I don't think it's redundant for the riggers. I think that, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, you don't need to impress the, the stage crew uh, when in rehearsal, <laughs> uh, but you do need to make sure that they're not concerned that you are going to get hurt because that's going to make everyone have a bad day. 
Um, so it is about building that trust. And, uh, you know, we had a conversation about where's, you know, where's, your, hey, where's your crash mat? Like you're up pretty high there. Uh, and the answer to that is, I don't know, do I, do I need a crash mat? Would you like me to have a crash mat? I have the skills to not need to rehearse with a crash mat, but maybe in rehearsals, I'm going to use it uh, so that I can help build that trust with the team I'm working with. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, does sometimes having a crash mat make you feel safer, Ginger? It depends on uh, how much height I have. If I don't have much height, if I'm in a 20 foot space and uh, the cra I have a, somebody puts a three foot crash mat under me, it doesn't make me feel safer because it um, get, there's something that my fabric can get, you know, just sort of caught around or it reduces my height. So it depends on the situation, depends on what I'm doing. Um, and uh, for training, I mean, yeah, of course, a mat is good, but for, for rehearsals on stage, no, personally. Um, it, you bring up an interesting point that uh, sometimes the, the, the perceived mitigation of risk, like adding uh, a big thick crash mat, um, mm -hmm. will actually add different risks. Or using the wrong mat, um, you know, if you have a big soft crash mat and what is really called for is more of a firm landing mat, you actually run the risk of twisting your ankle in the soft mat as you don't execute a perfect landing. And that can be, it's a different level of risk, but it can also mean that the act is out of the show for six weeks while the artist heals their ankle. Um, mm -hmm. So safety, you're only as safe as you feel. This phrase, Ginger, you introduced it to me and it really, um, uh, it's very accurate and also hard to understand sometimes for riggers. Um, how do you use this, this, this phrase? What does this mean for you? Well, I have to give this phrase um, credit to, um, to my husband, Yago. He's the one that, that said this to me. Um, I, um, I mean, like I said, I've worked in, in many places and I think that all of, uh, of the things that I've been hung from were all safe, but I've had, definitely had moments where, um, where I questioned the safety of the things around me and all the moving parts of them. And I saw this in someone else, and Scott, you might remember this from, uh, from Zed, the entrance of the hand-to-hand -hand act. Uh, it was absolutely safe. There was one artist uh, in a harness um, that the points connected between his legs. So he was hung upside down. And then the artist that was going into her hand-to-hand -hand act was hanging from hand loops that were hung from his chest. And because of the height of the diving board and the grid, they kind of had to go up in this weird scoopy position. And then from the very high steel, get lowered in and start her act. It was a very slow entrance and including the first position in the number, she might've been upside down for like three minutes in total. And she was terrified. Everything was safe. There, there was, she wasn't going to fall, but she was still terrified of it. So um, I, I was really uh, fortunate to have the, the team around that I did and I, I proposed some changes and we ended up um, uh, redesigning the entrance so that the artist transitioned into that position inside what we had to, it was called the matrix and it was a, a huge set piece that they could sort of be inside before the entrance. And after that, the artist was, was she felt safe after that. So. Guys, guys, if I could um, interject here for a moment, yeah. I do have some questions in the chat. I'm not sure with a couple of them, if they're appropriate for right now or not, but I thought I'd let you make that call. Can I, uh, can I read you a couple of them? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase a bit here. Working in convention centers, um, the riggers do static loads and that kind of stuff. But when the circus people come in, they do their own rigging. How safe or recommended safe 
is it for riggers, you know, the house riggers, if you will, uh, to do moving rigging of circus and aerial performers? Is that something you want to tackle now or will that be better addressed a little later on? No, let's, let's talk about it. it um, so I often end up having this conversation with acrobats about how this particular um, example, of, like you get booked on a corporate gig, it's going to pay really well. You go into a ballroom and you're going to meet some rigger that is the house rigger that hopefully you've emailed before, but maybe not. And you're going to have to work with them. Uh, and that rigger may or may not have any circus experience, uh, and he may not have the answers to the questions that you hope for. Um, so this is like a, you know, it's a challenging situation for acrobats to be in. And then the other side of the coin is it can be a really challenging situation for riggers to be in, especially if, I mean, you're a very good convention rigger that has rigged in your ballroom for 10 years, but you've never uh, rigged an artist like Ginger. Um, and you don't, how do you know, Ginger, how do you know how strong your fabric is? How do I know how strong it is? Yeah. Well, I guess you break it. There is that, but like, uh, riggers are accustomed to seeing on the hardware, on the thing, that it's got a number on it. And it says how basically how strong it is or what's allowed, what it's rated for. Mm -hmm. when, you, when Ginger brings in her fabric, I keep, there's nothing on there that says how safe it is, what, what it's rated for. I got to trust the acrobat in that moment that they know what they're doing. Um, and that's a, that can be a challenge. It's, honestly, that can be a challenge. You know, it's really interesting when you think about like really old school traditional circus acts that like use duct tape on their their safety belt and stuff like that. Like, I imagine for you guys seeing some of that stuff coming in would be really challenging. Um, and I have I don't really know how to answer this question for you other than that. Um, I guess it goes back to trust, right? You just you have to trust that they're professionals and they've been doing it long enough that they kind of know what they're doing. And if there's something that's really stands out that you go, no, 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 then it, it's your right to say no. Do, do silks not come with us as a, a recommended load they can take though? They do, but it's not written anywhere. There's no, there's no tag or anything. But do, but do you, you have some packaging when you order it? It comes with packaging that says it depends where you order it. it it's it's a, a funny apparatus because it could really just go down to Hetty's fabric right now and get, you know, a, a bunch of yards of it. And there's my apparatus. Um, Things in the industry are shifting yeah. somewhat that address this. Like I would say strongly five years ago, it was rare that uh, if I asked an acrobat at an audition, like, hey, where did you get this hoop? Uh, who made it and, um, you know, did it come with any paperwork? You know, most of the time that person with that hoop is going to say, uh, you know, my, I got it from the studio I trained at, or it was my grandma's or, uh, you know, it was, it was handmade by someone in their garage. Um, and that's, that's circuits, right? Um, more and more lately, uh, you're a, more manufacturers are offering, uh, let's call it credentials or ratings, uh, um, engineering on apparatuses and uh, metal apparatuses are much easier this way. And the soft goods are more challenging because they, well, the metal apparatuses wear out, but the fabric and soft good apparatuses wear out much faster. Um, so it's more common these days that a, uh, like aerial straps will have a tag on it. That'll say what the, a one way to say it is a safe working load, what that is. Um, but for fabric, it's still, uh, the best you're gonna get is basically a piece of paper from the people that bought that you bought it from saying, we broke test some of this and it breaks at this much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joel asks, and I think this is a pretty good segue. Uh, what are you, as a performer, what are you looking for, uh, your concerns, your needs versus the structural needs on the technical side? Oop, we just lost um, 
No, I just stopped the sharing because uh, I figured it'd be more fun to look at us than the ah, screen. Okay. All right. Always, always good to look at you know people. So anyway, let me go back to that question. Uh, let me find it here. As a performer, what are you what are you looking for? Your concerns, your needs versus the structural needs on the technical side. Do you need a translation on that? Or are you okay? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by structural needs on the technical side. Joel? Uh, I mean, um, I guess more for a technician, what, what are they just comparing what they're looking for? Um, like on the technical side, you'd be looking for how much like a load. Are you guys, are you looking for a load? Do you guys care about how much the structure can hold? Are you, are you thinking about that? or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an, I, I go back to when I joined La Nuba. Um, my first day at La Nuba, Scott Osgood was the head rigger. And first thing he did was take me up to the grid and show me uh, where all the winches were, showed me where the rigger stood over the winches watching, showed me the tubes that the cables went up through. And that, um, that, created a, an, an environment of trust because he showed me what I was hanging from, where there are other places where you can't really have access to the, the, um, the steel that you're hanging from. And um, being told where it goes above you, what, uh, just being given a tour through the building so that you know, A, you can imagine where you're hanging from and what's supporting it. And B, that the person that's hanging you knows what they're talking about. Um, getting a safe working load from about each, uh, each component, like this swivel and this carabiner and this pulley, it's not necessary, at least for me, um, but give, being given a tour of how my line is attached is helpful. Does that? Does that help, Joel? Yeah, I was trying to um, figure out the difference between where your equipment, the, your equipment and where the, the technical side, where the combination is of who's concerned about what and how you guys come up with the needs that, the needs that you need as a performer versus the safety needs and technical needs of the, stru of the physical structure that you're attached to. Yeah. But well, like I said, just getting a tour of how it all works, how it's all put together is really helpful. And Ginger, do you think that, that that's helpful because uh, it takes the mystery of the rigging out? Like you can understand it better rather than just say, ah, don't, don't worry about what's up there. It's totally safe. Yeah, it's like, I'm not just hanging from a cloud. You know, it's not magic. Like there's actual structure and, and thought was put into how everything works together in within the show and there might be multiple moving things um so yeah it's it's about um just demystifying the rigging of it is there a way that you determine what you need like do you know what how much weight you need to be able to, or what the structure needs to hold yourself the calculations on doing that or is it just based off experience i can feel that a little bit um the performer flying standard uh, is really the, the go-to place for figuring out how strong is strong enough. Um, and the, the quick answer on design factors is 10, six, and three. And it's, uh, you know, 10 times static weight or uh, body weight of the performer in this instance. Uh, involves flies, palaces, and poisonous underpants. Here's what you Okay. Hang on a second, folks. Can we have... Um... Microphones off, please. Unless that was the ether joining us. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a, and I would, I would, I would ask that we keep the microphones off. Um, let's try and use the chat as best we can um, for questions. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry about that. I'll be brief on the the the, the nitty gritty here, but six times dynamic force or characteristic load that's the key one for circus uh the acrobat is going to generate 
uh, a certain multiple of their body weight. Uh, and there is actually some documentation on that these days. Uh, so like uh, Ginger on a fabric act, setting aside the automation, just the tricks that she does on there can easily generate four or five times her body weight. Uh, so the performer flying standard says, take that figure, the dynamic force, the, the, the highest characteristic load, and then uh, multiply that by six uh, as your safety factor. And then the last one, a uh, safety factor of three is the worst case, uh, worst case possible load. And it's usually in terms of automation of e-stop load. Um, yeah. A um, couple more questions. Sure. Ah, oh, Scott England, chasing down engineering on apparatus that people bring into the training room is even a challenge at times. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I see Jonathan nodding his head, like he and I have had this conversation where we had totally different experience, not different experiences, similar experiences, but uh, for circ auditions, uh, where he was inspecting apparatuses that people were going to perform on. And, and, and maybe it was uh, more than five years ago. And he found that of all the stuff brought in, none of it had paperwork. And then I did it last year in Vegas for some stuff. And I found that maybe seven out of 10, uh, when I met the performer and they had their thing, I was like, okay, what, let's start with what can you tell me? Do you have any paperwork? uh who made it all those sorts of things and seven out of ten like got in their bag and pulled out you know pieces of paper that were very helpful in that moment to say yay or nay on um, inspecting yeah and if i can just tag on to that i'll stick my nose in here for a minute um as we continue down this path and we continue trying to change and move the culture forward we have to keep doing that both for, as on the technical side, the technician side, and on the performer side. We have to be vigilant when we ask for that kind of information. The more we ask, the more the chances are that people are gonna start giving it to us. As you, know, as you said, Andy, you know, seven out of 10 is a whole lot better than you know, two out of 10, um, but we want 10 out of 10 at the end of the day. And I'll be very honest as a circus rigger, it's a, it's a challenge because my rigging training, my rigging instinct is I have to know, like I have to know the rating on the truss. I have to know the rating on the wire rope. I have to know the rating on the everything, right? To do my job. And I definitely come across situations in circus where I'm not gonna be able to have that information and I still need to risk assess if what we're doing that day or that week or that year is going to be safe enough. Mm -hmm. It's challenging. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Tanya, uh, to follow up on what Serenity said in the chat about fabric, the ones that Ginger and I use. Uh, are tested by Cirque du Soleil for many years, but if you buy it direct from the manufacturer, um, my chat just jumped on me, but if you buy it direct from the manufacturer, they haven't done the testing themselves and it doesn't come with any certification or warranties. So it can get convoluted, um, especially for material that's been used for quite some time. I believe well, that Unicycle in France offers like a, a rating tag on their fabric. Um, fellow aerialist, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And I think that Aerial Essentials also sends a, uh, some, a, a small card of documentation and they send washing instructions as well. Okay. But Ginger, so, I mean, you've been performing on fabric for a long time. How do you mitigate, what, what do you do uh, with your fabric or what does your rigging staff do to make sure that it's safe enough? Like, do you use it indefinitely? No, I don't use it indefinitely, not because I'm afraid it's going to break, but I'm afraid that it's going to break me because at a certain point when the stretch wears out and I'm working with a, a winch and doing drops while the winch is going up, that the bottom of that, that drop is hard. You know, so I change, used to change the fabric like every two months. Um, 
unless it was uh, really dry in Vegas, I had to train, change it more often than I did in Tokyo. Um, but over the years, it's gotten a little bit complicated. There used to be a company in Montreal called Knit Rama that did all, that made all the fabric for, for Cirque. And uh, theirs was fantastic and we trusted it for years. They had a fire, they lost their machines. Some guy bought it, tried to bring it back. The fabric he made was subpar. I would get holes in my fabric after four shows from one specific drop. Uh, La Nuba had the same problem. There were problems all over, all over the board um, with, with fabric for a while there. And some shows sewed up the little holes, other shows changed it immediately as soon as there was a hole. So there really wasn't much consistency there. Um, but breaking fabric is hard. It's hard to do, it's very strong. Um, and you don't, you know, the, the, the way that you break it, of course, I mean, you guys know better than me, but the prolonged force against it is not something that you can replicate acrobatically. So okay. that's it's, my two cents on it. The fabric is still stronger than ginger. Yes. Right. And uh, Jonathan, by the way, Jonathan put in the chat um, one of the uh, more common fabric um, uh, knits that uh, are used. Uh, I know you, you're not seeing it, Ginger and, and Andy. 40 denier tricot, mm -hmm. not usually nylon, but sometimes polyester. I think that's, uh, that's non-stretch, isn't it? Polyester is lower stretch than nylon. Yeah. Um, and I just encountered a situation where a polyester fabric was being damaged by a skill and just switching to the nylon fabric, which was very similar in overall performance, was an important change to not damage the fabric with that same skill, same acrobat. Um, uh, and I was honestly kind of surprised by it. Um, but we had to figure it out because like the we have this fabric and we, we have it from a vendor, but I'm like, I'm not really sure if it's polyester or nylon. So I, you know, I I looked up the how to tell it into flame test, uh, we'll nerd out for a second, you know, uh, one of them burns with black smoke and one of them burns with white smoke. And both of them shed little drops of lava that burn and scar your fingers. Um, uh, so the, what Ginger talks about with the fabric and it wearing out is a big challenge, but how do you as a rigger meet that challenge? Well, she also said the answer. One is careful inspection. Uh, and two is uh, planned obsolescence, I guess, like a change out schedule. Like it's, it seems fine, it's working fine, but just to be safe, we're gonna uh, not use it indefinitely. We're gonna acknowledge that it's a consumable and we're gonna, um, you know, uh, not use it uh, tomorrow. We're gonna buy it some more. I think, I think Gordon's question will play right into that. Um, and it's a good question, in my opinion, anyway. Um, does the circus or the performer keep logs of use? Do they keep documentation? Um, you know what, I don't personally, because I didn't really need to. I mean, it was kind of clear, like we change it on the fifth of every other month kind of thing. And you just sort of, you start to feel it and you know that you need to change it. Um, for people doing, corporates and, and in training, uh, perhaps they do. I, I don't know anyone that does though. It, it's really, circus is more like you go, okay, well the tape's getting gross, I'll change it. Um, the fabric's getting floppy, I need a new set of fabric. We, uh, at the circus school here, we, we label the ends of the fabric, the, the bottom, the tail, um, mm -hmm. with, uh, with Sharpie. Uh, with a date and uh, a number which matches a log. Um, and then uh, I'll be honest, the inspection logging, uh, there's a lot of different schemes, but the, the main thing is that you are inspecting it and looking for errors and that hopefully you have a, you should never be in a situation where someone asks you, when was the last time it was inspected? And you don't know the answer. That's the key takeaway for logging inspections to me. Like you can get wrapped up in all the paperwork and all the everything. But when I 
you know, when if Ginger's coming in for an audition and I'm responsible, that's one of the questions I'm going to ask her. Like, when the last time did you inspect it? And if the answer that she gave me is, um, let me think, I'm not sure. That's not confidence inspiring, right? But just to, to point out another thing, it's as a Cirque du Soleil artist, it is not my it's not my job to to keep a log or to inspect my my apparatus. And if I started to do that, I think I would be met with uh, not a very nice mood from the rigging department. Why? I would, um, I, would I would I would suggest that my experience uh, as a technician and as an inspector working for Sir that. Uh, yeah, it's not your job. It's somebody. It was somebody's job, and they, it was being done. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just you weren't necessarily aware of it. Correct. Because if I started doing it, it would be, it would be an example of me not trusting the department, and that could start to cause friction. It's an well, inter interesting take on that. Yeah, I completely understand what you're saying, and I've seen it. I've seen it happen, but. I try my, one of my bullet point advice is uh, don't take it personally. Like an artist asking a rigger why or what, or can I look, can I go up and inspect the rigging please? Mm -hmm. I know plenty of riggers that are gonna react to that being like, well, you don't need to inspect the rigging. I'm doing my job just fine. You can trust me. Uh, and to a rigger, rigger conversation, like, that's a valid answer. Like, oh, okay, like I do trust you. I know you're doing your job. Uh, we, you know, you know what you're doing. Tra rigor having that same conversation with an artist, it gets trans, it can get mistranslated into they're hiding something. Mm -hmm. uh, on Kuza, every city, um, I climbed to the cupola of the tent with the Wheel of Death artist. And it was, he inspected his rigging uh, before he got on it, every new city. And I had the utmost respect for Jimmy for doing that. Um, and it was not a chore to go up there with him ever. But that was not looked at that way universally. Um, in fact, it wasn't a rigger, it was another person in the, in the a technician who kind of said to me like, oh man, it sucks you have to like jump through that hoop or you have to, you have to do that. That he can't trust you. And I was like, no, you got it backwards. Like I'm happy that he does that. Um, and he, uh, just like Ginger, he is a good rigger. Uh, he spotted things up there that we that were good inspection points. Like he's like, hey, um, that shackle's not mouse. I'm like, oh shit. Like you're right. We missed that. And I'm really happy that you as an acrobat understand why we should do that. One of the, um, other, one of the other things I might add here, if you're having challenges with the documentation and it's being misinterpreted by the rigor or the performer or management, whoever, um, you can throw OSHA, at least in, in the US, you can throw OSHA under the bus here. They require it, you know, and, and the first, if there is an accident and OSHA you know, is involved in the investigation, the first thing they're going to ask for is the paperwork. And if you have the paperwork, um, it's going to make that inv investigation go easier on everybody. And if you don't have the paperwork, now you're pissing them off. And you're starting off from a, uh, you know, uh, an adversarial situation. So, you know. I think the paperwork, the, the log books, I know for me as a rigger in a arena theatrical uh, discipline, it's important. It's, it's, you know, you got to do it, whether you like it or not, or whether you, somebody thinks that they're, you know, you're beating up on them, you got to do it. A bunch of questions. So you know, a, a fair amount of it has to do with um, what we've just been talking about. Uh, let's go back to Joel, if you don't mind, uh, do you feel there should be a type of standard or inspection criteria to follow for fabrics or is experience and tradition a comfortable standard to keep using? Uh, there's one trick I know will damage my fabric that I do in my act. And because of that, 
uh, we would inspect that area of the, the fabric more frequently than other areas. Um, should there be a standard? I, I mean, I believe there is a standard, no? Andy? Well, um, there is, that word standard and the, I think the usage uh, Joel is using is more like a, a document provided by the authorities. Like there is a standard which carabiners meet. There's a standard which shackles meet. Mm -hmm. um, there's no standard like that for aerial fabric. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's one of the challenges of surface rigging is that there, uh, there are big components of it that don't have manufacturers written instructions. Like I trust the Nyko press termination because uh, the manufacturer tells me how to do it and tells me how to validate it. Um, I trust, uh, you know, um, tying a knot in rope because the Cordage Institute tests it and their standards which have to be met by rope manufacturers. There's nothing like that for the apparatus that Ginger performs on. There is a kind of a communal knowledge of oral history of circus riggers that about how to inspect fabric and there's rules of thumb. Like if the fabric has a hole in it, like how big of a hole is enough to worry about and how little of a hole is okay, what's a pass? Um, Ginger, do you have an opinion on that? Um the whole the the issue of holes is is confusing to me because there have been major shows doing different things um for me when i see burn marks that's a little bit more um concerning you'll see kind of like uh, diagonal color changes of burn marks and to me that shows that that area of the fabric is becoming compromised um, and I would, would like to change it. We'll also, I'll feel it too. I'll feel there's less bounce. But again, I work on a really dynamic fabric and most, uh, most artists that I see don't work on dynamic fabric because it's very hard to get. So there, those fabrics will react differently. Uh, Michael, um, Michael was asking if you can describe the, um, the trick that you were doing that was putting holes in your fabric. Sure, sure. Um, it's a, a double back, a double back flip, but the winch was going down two meters at the same time that I was doing the, the drop. So the, uh, the end of the drop was, was pretty hard and where the fabric would cross on my leg was creating holes. There's also a, a slip knot that aerialists often do. They'll, they'll tie a slip knot and then um, descend onto the bottom part of the fabric under the slip knot and pull the slip knot out and do a drop. That slip knot is, is well known for causing damage to fabric. It's, the thing is there's a lot of heat and friction created in those moves and that's what causes the damage, right? Right, thank you. Yeah. But it is a challenge because the manufacturer is not gonna say like wire rope manufacturers will say, this is the pass fail on the wire rope. No fabric manufacturer is gonna say, how how big of a hole or how much of a run or or how much damage is acceptable it really is uh i don't want to say it's like my judgment call i really seek others uh, opinions or other circusers like jonathan and, and others on this call uh to say like what what do you guys do how do you guys handle this gray area okay I got one more and then I don't know if you want to, after this, go back to your, your notes, but Scott England, uh, when he's starting a new production, one of the conversations, every time I start reading, it jumps on me and I have to go back to it. Sorry about that. Whenever I st I'm starting a new production, one of the conversations I have with the performers is they are the ones using the apparatus or winch every day. So they are going to, to feel, notice a change long before the text will. So they should not hesitate uh, coming to us if something feels off, you know? Um, and they have, and they have, which has led to discovering, if not issues, at least changes that they noticed, but the text did not. Has that, has that experience 
you know, that you guys have had? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, that's great. I mean, Ginger, like Ginger, uh, what, uh, what's an example that from your experience where you've brought that to rigging? Uh, for example, um, I think it was at Mystere when the hand-to-hand -hand act was out, it changed the traffic in the grid and I could feel things that they nobody that, that normally happened, but they happened at a different time. And that feeling of just a feeling, you know, a vibration or something was quite um, concerning. And it, it, uh, it took a while to figure out why those things were happening because for the rigging team, they were just doing what they normally do. I, uh, there's a, on Kuza, we had like, it's a carpentry issue. It wasn't a rigging issue, but there was a dent. There was a divot in the stage uh, that like uh, Carp 2 discovered while he was mopping the stage. And it was severe uh, by this point. Like it was like you step in it and it was squishy, like an old uh, floor of an old Victorian house, right? And it was a problem. Uh, and so there was like furious activity and a show hold to like to shore up this part of the stage, right? And uh, the unicycle artist, uh, like, kind of popped his head out, like, what's, what's, what's going on? Why are we doing the whole show hold? And we explained, he's like, oh, that thing's been there for months. He knew it, and he just, it didn't, it didn't connect the dots for him to say, like, he just knew that he had to avoid that spot. Otherwise, he was going to have a balance check on his unicycle. It didn't connect with him that oh I should I should talk to the head carpenter about this that maybe he's going to want to know about it. Um, and then a great example on the rev is that we had a, a particular lay of wire rope that's prone to um, uh, bird caging, uh, and the way we're using it was pretty I don't want to say abusive but like high speed winches are abusive to wire rope full stop that's that's just what they are. Um, and, uh, we would get reports from time to time, like something feels weird. Right. And it was one of the first questions and it wasn't a question that we would ask to everyone, but we would ask carefully of stage management is please let us know the artist that's going to, that's giving us this note. And if it was a veteran that'd been on the show for 10 years and they said, Hey, that, that line feels funny. I was up there inspecting it right away because I knew from experience that there was a birdcage in it. We just hadn't spotted it yet. But when he said, oh, this line's bumpy, like he, that's like, I could pretty much just say, okay, we're going to cut that line now because I know it's got a birdcage in it because David said it doesn't feel right. Um, and it was more of a challenge when it was a novice uh, acrobat. Um, and that, uh, we still took it, obviously took it very seriously, but it was harder to chase down problems if the source of the note we were not really certain on. But what I've learned working with acrobats is when they say something feels different, something feels weird, there is something has changed. I just haven't found it yet. You know, when the, the high wire artist on Kuza said the wire isn't, doesn't feel right today or the wire hasn't felt right the last few days. It's my job to go and figure out wh what turnbuckle didn't get moused and I have to tighten it up and make an adjustment. But the fact that they're telling me that it doesn't feel right means that I just haven't found that turnbuckle yet. Let me, let me ask one of my questions. Um, if you're doing, as you describe, you're doing a, an act and something doesn't feel right, let's say you're in a new situation or you're on tour you're dealing with a new crew um, and you try to have that conversation, but you're unsuccessful in talking to the head carp or whatever. Is there a, a mechanism? Is there a vehicle that you can use to continue that conversation? Um, is there a way that, that you can have comfortably have that conversation, you know, further up the food chain, if you will? Has that happened? I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of things like that happening. Um, I would, for my, from my technician point of view, I think that when that situation happens, that there's a breakdown in communication between artist and technician, between aerialist and rigor, um, 
it's not always the case, but I'm going to say like 95% of the time I blame the rigor. Um, and it's that the rigor needs to be supportive of the acrobat. I mean, the difference between entertainment rigging and circus rigging, circus rigging, the, the, the load that we rig has emotions. Uh, you know, so understanding that on a human relation level is how you're good at being a circus rigger. So if you, if the situation you're describing, Bill, where like an acrobat is, is mentioning some dissatisfaction or some concern and they're not getting a resolution of it, that's a failure of the rigging department to me. I got to say also, it depends on the type of production you're working on, because if, if you're, for example, on a Cirque du Soleil show or any a show that has a coach, um, this is also where, where sports psychology comes in. Um, because there can be something else going on that's creating a, a concern for the artist that they're attributing to something and making it bigger in their minds. So it, like you said about going up the chain, you know, it's, we're all a team in a production environment. Like without one, one of us, there is no show and we're all there for the show. So when somebody's having a hard time, it's really important, I think, that, that everyone is supportive of that. And, and coaching or artistic direction um, can, can help that person figure out what it is that's bothering them. Does that? It's a, it's a big challenge. I, I know a rigger who tore apart an apparatus because the, the, the acrobat um, felt something wrong with it. And that rigger tore it apart and, and took a uh, you know, microscope to it. Like he's a really thorough guy. And there wasn't, he didn't find anything. So it's safe. Uh, he deemed it to be safe. It's in 100% working order. And when the acrobat asked him, that's what he said. He said, I didn't find anything. It's safe. The acrobat's reaction to that was, unfortunate uh, because to him it meant if you didn't find anything then something is still wrong mm -hmm. uh, and that was a hard situation for them to to collaborate on I mean I'll admit it uh, but um, uh, I think in that particular situation what Ginger said another person a coach being involved would have been very helpful um, uh, but also the approach of the rigor could have been more helpful with this particular acrobat in that moment, um, to understand that, I mean, he, he would learn from this mistake, but if in hindsight, if he had presented that same information differently, it could have inspired confidence instead it, it, it detracted from confidence. Um. So over in the chat, uh, I hesitate to bring this up, um, but there has been a bit of a, an introductory conversation about the, um, the accident that happened in Rhode Island, the Hair Act, you know, the Felt Ringling Brothers Hair Act thing. Um, and I think most of the conversation has been about, um, let, me, let me find the one. Bear with me here, I gotta scroll back. It, it's about liability. Um, at what point do the local riggers no longer trust the performer's own safety? Um, I'm not sure that we wanna get into a big conversation about this, but before we do, uh, I need to tell you that I was an expert witness on that case and um, for the for the performers and um, there is uh, i'm under a gag rule that i can't talk about anything that has not been released to the public okay um, uh, bill is the is the is the i did not say in the chat but is the the concern uh topical to like what what is a local 
venue rigor to do in this moment of like, I have some circus equipment that I am allowing to be rigged in my space. How do I make sure they're not going to drop seven people and we all get sued? Is that the gist of it? I think that's the gist of it. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Well, uh, I guess I'd like to start my reaction, but that's fucking tough. Like it's really hard um, for the local local rigor in that situation. And it really comes back, it comes down to trust. Like you, you how do you trust the, the circus rigor that's come in and said, oh, this is all good. And you don't have the, the bandwidth that day is the, the load in, the guy that's meant to load in all the points to go in and check every single apparatus. Um, so that that is a really challenging situation. And also like from the artist's perspective, and I hope, I know Ginger can ring in on this, like for those four artists that got dropped, like, I mean, they trusted that apparatus and they put their trust erroneously in a person who made a, deci a poor decision. Um, but they, to get to pay their bills, to do their passion, their art, they had to trust this person. Um, so it's a, it's a, the answer to that question is really challenging. I think one of the, one of the, the questions that's coming up in the chat is, um, well, should, should there be a, a circus rigger doing that kind of work or should the, the venue rigger be doing it? Um, I know what my answer is, but this is your thing. So, go, go, you know, if you want to speak to that. When you say circus rigger, you mean the person whose act it is? I'm like, not. If yeah. I came to a venue and wanted to put up my tissue, would I be a circus rigger? I'm not sure what the the person who asked the question is, uh, mm -hmm. but but you're right. That is a that that is a challenging question because it's hard to know. I mean, in my opinion, anyway, it, it's it's relatively easy to know who the circus rigger is when you've got a Cirque du Soleil or a Feld or you know a big touring mm -hmm. show because you're going to have somebody there who's responsible, both if you're an individual working the, the, the convention center uh, circuit, then yeah, who is that? Is that you or is it the head rigger for the tour? Um, I would think that, you know, if you're on your own, you know, you're doing, as I say, the convention center circuit, uh, you're either going to have an association with somebody who is a rigor of some, you know, a, a rigor of some caliber, uh, or you're going to have that information yourself. Right? Somebody has to know what they're doing, and if it's not you, the performer, then you, the performer, have to have somebody else. They may not necessarily be on the job. They may not be touring with you, but they need to be, you know, available when when you show up someplace and you don't get what the rider called for. Um, the, I think framing it in terms of like, G Ginger's point's very valid. Like traditional circus, the acrobat is the rigger. And I honestly, I find a lot of value in that. Like the, in Vegas, I know a lot of uh, uh, show riggers, circus riggers that used to be performers. And the, ethic that they bring to the rigging is something that I try and emulate because their sister's hanging on it. Their mom is hanging on it. Um, and I always try to, uh, well, in some cases uh, in my career in Vegas, my wife was hanging on it. So, but I try and bring that level of care to every, uh, you know, every bit of service rigging I do. Um, uh, the, the challenge I think with like the ringling hair hang accident is that the, the rigging design was flawed. The person who made that apparatus, who designed that rigging, um, they made a really critical mistake and how a venue rigger can protect themselves from allowing that mistake to ruin their day, uh, is the advanced work. Like, I need to see, you, I'm not going to let you hang anything without you sending me the paperwork. And that's, that's going to help you 
but it's not foolproof, right? Like I could get a perfectly good picture of an apparatus that uh, looks good and meets, ticks all my re circus reading boxes. But then on the day of, they've made a change that's not on the paperwork. That can happen. Um, but then also there's a, um, an expertise question, like is the venue rigor at the theater or the arena gonna have the skill set to be able to say that this particular circus rigging apparatus is safe or not. Um, and I don't think that every head rigger at every arena in the US, in the world is gonna be able to make those judgment calls. And that's a challenge. Um, I don't know how to get around that other than like, you know, call me or call Jonathan or call Bill uh, and Bill will refer you to Jonathan or me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or plenty of other great service riggers to say, I need you to review this and, and get a second opinion and tell me that these, the circus show that's coming in is doing it safely. Um, I, when I was with Cirque du Soleil, we performed in the Royal Albert Hall in London, which is an amazing experience, but uh, uh, about like nine tenths of the way through Loden and I'm like bleary eyed, exhausted, uh, the venue, uh, administrative person comes up to me with something to sign. And it was basically, uh, you as the head rigger are now taking, you are assuming liability for all of your rigging. You are releasing the Royal Albert Hall from any uh, liability if your stuff falls down and goes boom. Um, and you know, of course I signed it, but it really, that moment of signing it really confirmed to me the gravity of the promotion I just accepted like okay this I mean I've, I've always been responsible for all this stuff uh but like um this Victorian era venue which is the pride of London uh I'm responsible for it today uh and the safety of all my friends and family that are in it um that's that was a tough piece of paper to sign welcome 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 to rigging in the UK yep <laughs> When, um, when I was 19, I, uh, I fell from a swinging trapeze uh, during, it was my, my premiere show and I fell due to uh, poorly designed rigging. And after that accident in which I broke both my arms, um, I came to the conclusion that as an aerialist, I was going to have to accept responsibility for whatever physically happened to me. Um, and that was a very, uh, it, it was challenging, but not as challenging, I think, as holding uh, somebody else responsible for my choices for the rest of my life, you know? So I, um, I, I you know, came to that point and throughout my career, which, you know, I, I stopped performing when I was 38. Um, so another 20 years, I, I didn't hit the ground again, but I certainly had lots of scary moments. and each one of those, I had to take responsibility that I was the one that made the choice to get on the rigging and to go up in the air. So just from uh, an artist's perspective, and I know I don't, not all artists share that perspective, from, but from my perspective, it's my choice to go up. So what happens to me is my responsibility. Uh, my honest reaction to hearing Ginger say that, I mean, is, is like, um, I think that's the right attitude, but also like, it kind of scares me. Like, so I, I think that Ginger is right. Like she has to hold responsibility for her safety, uh, but also like she she's gonna depend on that Nyko press that my crew pressed. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jimmy went up and inspected the rigging, yeah. you know? And that's why I ask all the questions that I ask at a gig too. It's because if I don't ask all those questions, I might not make the right choice. And the, what I need to remember and remind my peers is that those questions are not uh, questioning, that's not questioning my ability. That asking those questions is not, um, it's not your girlfriend saying, let me see your phone. <laughs> that was uh, my line. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not an attack it's a dialogue uh it's um you know that when ginger says you know can i go up and look at the rigging 
Um, I'm not saying, well, don't worry about it. It's fine. Don't you trust me? It's like, yeah, of course. Let me like, like, let me just tell stage management they're going to have to wait right now because we need to go look at the rigging. Otherwise, we're not doing a show tonight. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I stole your line. <laughs> and that and that's a conversation that's happening in the chat too. Tanya has a has a well crafted response here that goes on. I suggest that you read it rather than listen to me read it. Um, it's it's a it's a good response to that. Um, there have been some questions about insurance and liability, and we have about 15 minutes in the official time here. And if I may, um, you know, that's a different seminar, you know, in, in insurance and liability. And I think it's important to understand that almost everyone um, in the performer and technical side, they don't understand the realities of insurance. And, you know, it's not going to help. It's not going to help even when you do start diving into it because it's, it's a quagmire. Um, I think working in this context from a, you know, doing the right thing and making sure that everybody is safe from your perspective and from the perspective of the, um, of the technicians, you know, back and forth with the, with the performer is a much better approach than worrying about liability. If you have to talk about liability, let's wait until the back end of this a little bit, and then we can get into it. I, uh, my thoughts about liability are that the best way to deal with insurance is not have to have to use it. Uh, and I've, I try to focus my energy on that, preventing accidents and informing a culture of accident prevention, whatever I can with my peers and the people I work with. And that, um, uh, yeah, you gotta be prepared for the worst case scenario. You have to have insurance. Uh, but I, I hope that I'm not ever in a situation yeah. where that my insurance provider has to pay out because of something I did. Yeah. Zane has a good question, I think that can move us on here. Um, as Ginger said, it's important for performers to understand how the rigging operates and for riggers to understand how artists use their apparatus. Who is responsible for breaking the ice? Do you have any tips to help communication between artists and techs? And I think this is a question for all of us. Yeah. You know, I would say if, if it's a situation where you're a rigger at a show and a new artist comes in, it's your responsibility because you're already part of the production and you know what's going on. Um, in fact, I, I might just lean towards it's more of the rigger's responsibility than the artist. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you saying the tour rigger or the local rigger? Ooh. Ooh. Um, I mean, the, the assumption is that the artist is walking into the rigger space, not that the artist has their own theater and invites the rigger in. Yeah. Right? So in that case, I would say that the rigor is responsible for introducing the artist to the environment in which the artist will be suspended. I, I think it's important to recognize the inherent power dynamic uh, situation, which plays into a lot of things. Uh, a lot of times it's gender uh, that, you know, you have a uh, female acrobat who's often younger than an older, often crotchety uh, rigor. Um, and the burden of making that being friendly in that moment, uh, I, I, I agree with gender, it falls on the rear. Um, it's, it's hard enough to go get up on that apparatus and uh, risk your life and be beautiful and entertain everybody. Uh, you know, like my job is servicing those needs. One of those needs is that you're only as safe as you feel. You need to feel safe in my big top. Um, and that's the, that's my duty. Anybody else want to take, jump in on that? Um, usually as starting new shows, <clears throat> um, it's usually hours upon hours when the performers walk into a new space that we are giving them tours and showing them all around the loading galleries, the grid, any place they want to see, 
because we and that's part of that statement earlier is getting them aware of the entire facility and all the equipment because they as i said they're the first line they're the ones who are going to feel it and know it first and you know it's like they they need to be aware of who's responsible and who's going to be there um as their point of contact for every department you know and that's that's one of those that's part of that rigging is trust andy it's like you know they have to they have to like not only know the equipment but know the people and that's usually the first time the artists walk into a new space is just spending time familiarizing them with who and what at this at the at the school here um something came up about a, a student having a question or, or something and i said to the person that brought it to my attention well you know she should she can just come ask me and that person i was talking to said well i think she might be kind of intimidated and i was like a little bit like part of me was like what i'm, I'm why and uh i didn't get defensive and say i'm not intimidating like that would ever work right um but to own it and realize that okay yeah like i'm i'm the new partly i'm the new guy here um i do lots of stuff uh nearby them but i don't really you know interact with them a lot and so i it was on me to take the moment to go and try and break the ice to be to generate a comfort level with this uh acrobat so that they would have the 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 breathe the air the, the the they would have the space to be able to ask me the questions they wanted to ask me i would also just say what andy was saying earlier about pre uh, doing advanced work um it's hard to welcome a, an acrobat or a team of acrobats into your space if you didn't if you aren't really knowing that they're going to show up until the day of like um doing knowing what's going to be coming and and being aware of how what the needs are of an acrobatic troop versus just a, a show that we're hanging trust for or whatever like that there are different needs um like what scott was saying and what andy said like um it, i think it's part of owning um knowing doing your own prep work to help be hospitable to the people that are coming into the space too. Yeah, I know times I've definitely failed that when uh, people surprise me that there's new people coming in. And of course, I'm anxious now, like I'm not ready. Uh, so they can see I'm anxious <laughs> because I don't hide that well. <laughs> and they perceive that potentially that, oh, they're anxious because I'm here. Like this is a prop. This is like he's not comfortable with me being here. I'm not. I'm not well. Um, so yeah, like that's uh, prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the problems that we encounter with communication or, or problems in getting our job done can be alleviated by better preparation. And most likely, you'll have the the names of people coming in. It, it, it's good to know who they are as well. Like just, you know, search them up. We've got the internet. Like I've gone into gigs where, you know, some, they, I've been treated like, like I'm, you know, this big, like I'm just a kid that walked in off the street and it's like, no, wait a second. Like I, I, I know what I'm talking about. And then there's a little bit of friction there for a little while. So it's nice to come in being, uh, being known. I think along with the lines of the tech staff being welcoming to the performers and the new people coming in is to recognize that uh, they don't know what, what we know intuitively that the, the head riggers in charge, what are the head riggers in charge of, what the role of the technical director is, what the role of the stage manager is, and that we are, we're both people, but we're titles as well. Like we have job duties. So like that way of, um, understanding who they need to talk to isn't maybe not clear to uh especially novice uh performers um like they got booked on this gig and they come in and they they don't know who the right person may be to talk to is and part of my job is to make sure that they 
to try and explain it to them or to try and help them realize it and not just be like, eh, sorry, that's not my job. Like, oh, you want you want to know where your dressing room is? Ask, uh, you know, ask the stage manager. And they're going to be like, I don't even know who the stage manager is. I just got here. I got a, a, a question just occurred to me listening to you, Andy. Um, is there, I know there are circus schools around the country. Uh, I'm not overly familiar with any of them, to be blunt. Um, but I assume they teach circus arts. Do any of them teach the um, pre-production stuff? Like we've been talking about, like having information to give to the, to the, to the, to the local, to the to the you know the technicians in the venue, and knowing what information to get from them, is there any kind of are there any kind of classes out there that do that kind of communication skills? You know, I I don't know. Like, where I got to think about like where did I learn it, right? And I I probably learned it in my college theater uh, you know courses about uh, and and experience, like who's running the rehearsal those sorts of sort of things that become second nature to us that do it, uh, they weren't always second nature. And it really depends on, I think like Ginger could speak to the traditional circus, like, you know, uh, the, like the, I don't know, I don't even know on a traditional circus where the, where Ginger is gonna, Ginger and Ginger's family are gonna rig their apparatus. Like who do they come talk to about what time it is for me to rig my apparatus? Right. I mean, those questions we're asking now, but it would seem to me that, you know, we've been doing this long enough now. You know, this is not something that just started four years ago. And it would seem to me that there are some processes in place that can be passed on, however you do that, to the younger generation, to the kids that are coming out of, you know, out of school, you know, a reg traditional school into a circus school. And on the other side of that fence can be taught as a rigging training, as part of a rigging training, so that, you know, folks coming into the business know that they have certain requirements and expectations when they're doing a circus show. Um, you know, I, also my family owned a circus school in Toronto for many years. And I think it's the same at most circus schools at a certain point in your program, you start performing and you start being part of a sort of pre-professional team. And those skills get learned along the way. Um, but a ENC for sure teaches their students um, pre-production and that, you know, they need to have a, a tech writer and, and, um, I'm sure that NECA is probably doing that in their professional program. I see Serenity wrote that in the chat. Um, so it, it, is, it is coming along. Um, and one thing that uh, I just want to bring up too is that uh, it's, um, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it, sorry. <laughs> I lost my train of thought there for a second. Yeah, I know that one. I'm going to have to go in about 15 minutes. OK. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I want to segue into something that Ginger and I have recently been talking about. Uh, and I, we don't need to go back to my pre-prepared bullet list, but it was on there. And it's that uh, comments about my body are not welcome. Uh, and uh, that's a hard thing for a male to to recognize sometimes, especially like a, a privileged white male uh, to be like, oh, well, you know, like you look pretty today. That's that's the compliment. That's not making someone feel uncomfortable. I'm being nice. I'm being friendly. Um, yeah, and on the side, just don't even go there. It's like if I said to Andy, like, you know, you're no, no wonder you're such a great rigger with your your um, uh, nimble fingers, or you're you have such a fat thumb, and go, that's why you must be so good at opening carabiners or something. <laughs> like it can go the other way too, right? It doesn't always have to be the rigger to the female artist. Um, it's uh, in the sense that we were talking about it was also to just. Uh, 
compartmentalize the relationship between the rigor and the artist, especially on stage, and to you know not approach the beginning of a training session by talking about the artist's hair, for example. Yeah, I've definitely had uncomfortable conversations with other male riggers, I'm thinking of one in particular, uh, that, you know, on shows where he would be like, he would make comments to me, another male, right, about uh, a female's appearance that we worked with. And uh, I got, I had to tell him to stop. Like, you know, he, did, he didn't, he took offense, like he did not like that. But one of the things I said to him in that conversation is like, hey, one of those performers is my wife. Yeah. Uh, and the way you're, you're, you're thinking and talking about these performers is making me uncomfortable, uh, let alone how they must be feeling. Uh, so it, it's, part of it comes back to you're only as, as safe as you feel. Uh, so like, if you don't feel safe with the gender dynamic of the team that you're working with, I mean, how does that affect your confidence in uh, getting up on your apparatus that day? I don't think it helps. Yeah, I've had an, an, a situation with an operator of mine that um, that expressed uh, an interest in me. This was a long time ago. Uh, and we were able to move past it professionally, but I always felt after knowing that I was distracted during training by the fact that he wasn't maybe not looking at my height against the wall for the landing, but he was looking at me in a different way. And it was, it was really, uh, it, it ended um, the relationship, the professional relationship. So do stay away from that. I think it's obvious. Well, I mean, I, I guess in, in 2021, I would hope it's obvious, but I mean, mm -hmm. I, I won't get into it, but like recent, uh, you know, things have been in the news this last few months that have shaken, you know, that confidence that like, you know, I mean, you, I don't know how to put this. Uh, you know, not everybody sees it that way, I guess. Not, they're, not all riggers are gentlemen. Uh, and if you're not a gentleman and you're on my rigging crew, uh, I'm going to have a problem with that. And <laughs> Like I remember on Delirium, for example, we were going into arenas, right? So there were the arena work, like the re arena crew, and then there was our crew. And uh, I would be warming up in a hallway somewhere and there'd be like a gaggle of this like local crew just like watching me warm up. Like, you know, it's interesting, but you, it's still really not cool. <laughs> it's interesting, like it's interesting to watch someone warm up, but uh, yeah, just stay. You know, someone Someone sent me a comment ahead of time or a question ahead of time about like, how, how can you be friends? Is it okay for rigorous acrobats to be friends? And my reply is like, yeah, I have great acrobat friends like Ginger. Um, but you keep the, Ginger and I talked about this. You try and you keep that friendship off stage. So when you're on stage, it's just business, right? Like, uh, and you respect that space on stage. But then when it's off stage, like I, Ginger, that story of like you having the drooling rigging crew, uh, you know, in the hallway watching you warm up. Like I picture, I wasn't there, but I picture like another female uh, acrobat I worked with that I kind of, wonderful friend, but there was a bit of like a little sister, big brother relationship. I would have, I would have raised hell and shoot them off. I'm like, get, get the fuck out of here, guys. This is not, this is not helping anything. This isn't your job. Like go, I don't know, go have a cigarette at the loading dock where you belong. Yeah, and I think that's extremely important. In fact, I was just going to, to say something about that and to reinforce what you just said, Andy. We all need to take ownership of that. We all need to understand that um, inappropriate behavior is the problem of the people creating the inappropriate, doing the inappropriate behavior, not the victim. And we as a culture tend to look at the victim rather than the people who are creating the problem. Um, you know, you know in, in, in that situation, you know, Ginger, what you were describing, we, we're trying to get to, and hopefully someday we will, where somebody in that group or somebody coming upon that group and sees 
sees that group will go, you know, you're done, get out of here. You can't do that, you know, without turning to you and saying you should go somewhere else, you know, because it's not you. But we, because there's mostly technicians, I've, you know, we've got some, I think we have some performers here, um, but you know, there's a lot of technicians on this, in this audience. We need to own that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for, for putting it that way. Uh, Andy and I were talking recently about the dynamics backstage and how odd it is in circus that you can you can have a normal like office type moment where you're all standing around the water cooler but there's a couple of people that are like literally in, in in something the size of underwear and we don't need to talk about that like in circus there there is skin and we don't need to talk about it we don't need to to address it we just move on and and again, that goes back to the power dynamic between riggers and artists, aerialists, female aerialists, is that you guys are all zipped up in black with equipment on, and we're typically not wearing much, and it's usually pretty tight. And so there, there's a that intensifies the power dynamic that's already there when it comes to age and experience level as well. So um, being aware of that is really important. There are some parts of being a rigger where you have to be able to get inside the bubble of a acrobat to check their equipment. Uh, a spotting belt is a big, a big one, right? And you've got to get down there and look at it. Uh, and it, there's a, there's a way to do it to, to help it not be awkward. Um, and it really is about how you present yourself, but also what you say, like, um, I'm, you know, I'm going to check your belt. Uh, I'm going to do this. Uh, I need you to, uh, I'm, I'm going to need to check how tight this is. Uh, those sorts of communications about it and gauging the reaction and getting permission, like don't assume permission, uh, that, you know, Hey, I, I need to adjust the strap on, on your harness. Uh, you good with that? Okay, thanks. I'm gonna do it now. Okay, I'm done. Um, those simple ways of just having, uh, a, just saying what you're doing and creates so much, goes a long way for bedside manner. Uh, a horrible turn of phrase for this particular topic, but, for, but that's important. Like, I'm not just gonna rock up to the, and especially not if I'm running late, like up to the harness I need to check and just start grabbing and pulling and then, you know, like, hey, you're done. That's not showing respect. Mm -hmm. And as well, if you can do it where you've assembled a group of the acrobats or aerialists together and you can you can inspect them, not in a one-on-one a, a -on -one situation, that's really helpful too. Oh yeah, that's, that's definitely. And that's one of those, like a finer point of like show creation of like, you know, if you can think about that and be like, oh, well, we're going to have the four formers get checked in this station by two riggers instead of they're all going to disperse throughout the theater and one rigger is going to check one performer. You've eliminated a potential place for uh, uncomfortable interaction or helps to eliminate that. Mm -hmm. This goes back to the first comment you made when we started this and it's called, it's all about trust. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bill, are there more questions in the chat uh, before we lose uh, Ginger in six minutes? This, if anybody's got a question, go ahead. There's been lots of comments, but they've been kind of reinforcing the conversation more than asking direct questions. I got a jet here pretty quick. I just wanted to say thank you to Ginger, Andy, and Bill. Um, wow. This has been a reinforcement of a lot of things that I've been picking up, and there's been a bunch of new information. Thank you very much to everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Um, I want to tell a, a self-effacing story. <laughs> uh, one way to build trust is to own your mistakes. And I think that in my progression to becoming a head rigger with Cirque du Soleil, I can picture one moment where it could have gone 
either direction. Either I was never going to be a rigger again for the circus, or I got to go forward and become the head rigger on the show. And I was learning uh, the lead rigging track, and there was a pretty, there's a lot of activity going on on stage. And I never, I was not yet qualified to run the winch act, but I was doing winch changes. And uh, the intermission, like it was a fine, like well, oiled machine. All the technicians wanted to get done with it timely and go have their break while they could, right? So there was a lot of activity at the rigging control station that was me. And when you're new at anything, you're not going to go fast. So I was anxious about that. Like I needed, I kept feeling like I was behind, like Eric was waiting on me. And of course they're my friends. So they're giving me a rash of shit for, uh, you know, you know, when they're waiting on me. Right. And um, I had been given the note many times that when I moved to the witch, I needed to go slow. Great advice. And of course, hard to remember when you're anxious and you're trying to go fast, right? So I was doing the change. I looked out at the stage. I saw what I thought I saw in error. I did not see what I meant, what I thought I saw. And I flew the winch out screaming fast with my buddy hanging onto it. Yeah. And uh, he flew out about 15 feet, hanging on to the rope with his death grip. And uh, of course I saw it and I flew him right back in and out of fear, pure terror and adrenaline and instinct, I touched him down the most perfect landing I've ever landed on a winch. And uh, he came over to me and was like, what the fuck was that? And I was like, I don't know, what the fuck was that? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we got through it and we kept going on the, the rest of the intermission change. And I was like fucking super rattled. And then the head rigger, he let me, I mean, he gave me the space to finish up the change, right? He asked other people what happened and he found out the story and he came up to me. And the question he asked me was, um, how can I trust you? How can I trust you to run rig one? And I said, dude, I don't know. That's what I'm asking me right now. Um, and so he, you know, he gave me some space with that. And I ran the rest of the show. He didn't boot me, he didn't bench me. But I think that my reaction to it um, was what made him trust me. Sounds good. Yeah. I had a, a similar one, um, an, another, a, a learning moment with automation at Zed. Uh, there was a cute, we, it was my first, like I said before, but maybe, you know, you don't remember, but it was my first show with actual automation. And there was a, a trick. I came down and I got a bunch of slack. And once the slack cue was complete, I would walk up stage and start to wrap. And then I would do one more turn, get one more slack cue, go to my position and fly. Well, I arrived. I took my slack. I started to walk. I got more slack. I did my wrap. I walked close to the point, but not quite to the usual takeoff point. I gave the cue to fly. And instead of flying, I got slack. So because of that, I took off, I started to take off the key because I'm like, well, I'm not flying. Something's messed up. And at that moment, my operator was looking at the console and realized, oh, she wasn't at the target height. Now she is. Click. And I flew with just a wrap, did a little wrap around my leg, like not a key at all. And what we came back with after was, was really interesting because this was in Japan, it was Japanese, it was Ayumi Scott. And um, he met me at the elevator. I think I cut the act right after that. He met me at the elevator, just so apologetic. Now I was apologetic and we both obviously fucked up. What ended up being the cause of it was that the slack cue I got when I landed was not complete when I started walking. And one of the reasons it wasn't complete is because I was on new fabric, which is stretchier. <laughs> so there's like all these layers to stuff. But we deduced this and we realized what our issue was. We changed the cue structure, made the, the D cell of that cue really hard so I could feel it. And then of course, nothing ever happens like that again. Um, but this was one of the talking points that Andy had and I had in preparing this was how important it is to own your mistakes and how that really nurtures trust and creates trust and not taking it. So, 
it's so much easier to get defensive, to blame somebody else, to panic and say, uh, what was it? these are all the reasons why I, I fucked up. These are all the reasons why I went wrong, right? Um, no one wants to hear that. Yeah. That, doesn't, well, that doesn't make them sympathetic to you. Like what Ginger wants to hear from me when I fuck up is, I fucked up, I'm gonna fix it. Yeah. And then after that moment, then we can talk about the details and like, here's how I think I fucked up and what I'm gonna do so that never happens. Mm -hmm. The- uh, yes. I was going to say I had a, a similar situation with Taruk where um, I was playing a character, but uh, it was actually two of us because we would alternate shows and they loaded the wrong stack of cues in for the show. So it was the other performers cues. Our first cue was exactly the same. And then my second cue was supposed to take me down and the, and the other performers cue would have been to go up. So I do my visual cue and my fabric goes up instead of down. And I was like, interesting. And then I could tell right away the fabric stopped moving halfway through the queue. And I was like, they've locked the fabric. This is excellent. I'm just gonna keep going because that was a, a thing that happens sometimes anyway. And we just do the act static. And when I came down, like the automation just came straight to me. Stage management came to me, explained what had happened and just profusely apologized. You know, and I was like, the, the thing for me was, I was like, the instant that they saw, okay, this isn't right, they they stopped it and made it, you know, safe for me to continue. And my, my thing was just like, okay, I, I just want to know how are we going to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Because for me, I was going further away from the floor. And if it had happened to the other performer who was supposed to go up and then went down instead, I was like, so so this we need to have a protocol and they were like yeah we're already talking about it and we're going to come back to you and let you know what it is so that it doesn't happen again but yeah just the fact that they were willing to really take that on made all the difference and then by the same accord like every time that i forgot to give a visual cue to like the poor audio team if i like mess something up and i like there were a few times when i tried to make up time by being like oh i'll skip that figure and i'll move to the next one and and then afterwards was like except they needed that cue. And so that was that was on me to go to automation or to go to audio and to be like, that was my bad. In my head, I was trying to make up time and catch the music back up. And I shouldn't have done that because they can stretch that, but I need to give you your signals. I'm sorry. You know, like, that's the thing. It's like, it really is, none of this happens without teamwork. Yeah, exactly. And that's why all those protocols are so important as well, like what you bring up of the artist going down and getting, if she had gotten your cue and went down while going down. Um, I had another one at, I don't, won't mention the show, but I had a, a trick, I was doing like a, a twisting trick very close to the deck. And I think the trick descended like three meters and then I was, the winch was supposed to go up at the same time to clear me from the deck. If it didn't go up, I would hit the deck. Well. Um, during the act, not during that move, but during the act, someone tripped over the power cord to the winch and there was an e-stop. Um, because of the stupidity of that happening uh, and the potential for other stupid things to happen, I, I re-cued that trick so that instead of there ever being a potential of hitting the deck, I would start from a very high height and get a cue to go down while doing that same trick. And if there was an e-stop, wouldn't hit the deck. So it, it's all of that. And, and tissue is very specific. It, it's one of the only apparatuses where the artist changes their height on their apparatus during a flight. I mean, there are things that you could do on hoop, but- Just not to the same scale, yeah. yeah the same scale. Tissue is very unique in that sense. I think that the, Tanya, the, the thing that I caught from that is not is also the, you know, the avoiding the problem, right, of how they figured out to make sure that never happened again. But what intrigues me is the moment that you said that the, the, the fabric stopped moving and I, then I knew that I could go into the contingency. And that is really key uh, for the rigor and the acrobat and the stage manager to all clearly understand what that is. 
and um, you know, the safest thing is if you get off sequence or whatever that you just call, that's the end of the act and when we move on to the next act. But that doesn't always help with other knockoff effects. Like maybe the, the scenery preset isn't gonna have all the time it needs, you know, or all those other things. So the fact that you guys had a, a, a way of understanding that you got the message that, okay, I'm safe to proceed with the contingency um, is, uh, when that's like a key part of planning those types of acts. Um, you know, we had one of the bullet points we talked about and the advice I give to acrobats when they go out and do gigs uh, with a new team is to ask, what's the rest of your plan and when do we rehearse it? Um, and you can expand that, con that concept is key. Like you, uh, every, the acrobat has to know what the rescue contingency is and it should really be done before you start rehearsing. Um, but all those other contingencies to keep the show going um, also have to be thought about ahead of time. And if you don't have that clear communication, that's where, oh, I expected this to happen, or I was going to try and do this. And the, and the other, the stage manager or the rigger or whoever was like, oh, I expected we're going to go the other direction. And that's where you can get into really risky situations. Definitely. Definitely. And that's where it becomes much bigger than just just an artist on stage. And I, I think that's so uh, so interesting for the audience perspective because to them, it's, a, you know, Tanya, you're a soloist, you're up there, you're doing your thing, but it's it's unclear how many people are behind the scenes supporting that to happen. Um, it really is about teamwork. And especially when you're doing an, an, an act on a, on a winch, when you're moving, it's not a solo, it's a duo or however many people are on stage and however it's being operated, that's a team. One thing that contributes to teamwork and trust is don't don't take it personally. Like if Ginger says to me, uh, that was a little late. You took that flight a little late. It's so easy to be like, no, I didn't. I took it the same place I took it yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's conflict. Like that's not going to help Ginger have any confidence if I'm just going to be defensive. So the, I mean, like the correct response is, OK, I'm, you know, like, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to work on that. Or let's clarify what the cue is. Yeah, let's yeah. clarify because maybe I'm doing something different too. Yeah. You know, and like I, I had a great relationship with one of my operators on Zed. We were great friends off stage and still great friends. But on stage, it was just business. His voice was monotone on the, on the mic. My voice was monotone on stage. There was no need for eye contact. We would just talk about numbers, A cell, D cell, whatever. Didn't matter. And, and another show, if I made a comment like, uh, I think you were late, we should watch the video. Uh, I had a situation where I said that in a training and the head rigger made the operator go and watch the video by himself in the artistic lounge, which was a very uncomfortable thing to do. And, and it came down to me being the one that was like, you know, like giving him a hard time about making a mistake when that's not it at all. It, it is 100% teamwork. So yeah, not taking things personally is a big deal. For the artist too. Ginger, I, I do want to point out the time. Yeah, I know. I, I got I got myself an extra 10 minutes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barb, you said you're asking if you may say something as an op. Of course you may. Please do. Barb. Hi. Um so as an operator, one of the more valuable things that I've experienced was there was a disconnect between me and my performer in exactly what they were asking for as far as like the A cell, the D cell, and the velocity, like a lot of those things. Um, my performer had a different understanding of it than I did. So one of the things that I did is I went out and I took a couple of aerial lessons so that I could more understand the apparatus that they were on. And then the other thing that I did too is um, it was a winch system. So I had another operator fly me on the winch so that I could understand the sensations that they were feeling to better understand what they were asking for. And oh, yeah. I think that's something that's really critical as an operator is you need to understand the system that you're on. And the best way to do that is to fly on it yourself. Um, sometimes that can be a little difficult depending on the apparatus or um, sometimes there's weight requirements. So 
it may not be feasible, but it is really critical to have a um, understanding of how that machine operates. And I feel like one of the things with all of the performers I've worked with and something myself is I have a lot more trust in my operators and in myself is I will put myself on this machine. Like I, I had trust the rigging that I have done on this machine enough that I will put my own personal life on it. And that may be a comfort to you, your performer. Um, and that's just kind of a random thought. Oh, it's so awesome. Yeah. It's so awesome. I, I'm thinking back to the Reign of Bodies on Zed, which was like a hydraulic, and I, I can't explain the mechanism well, but you know, Scott, you could take over. But anyways, we were slowly descending from about 85 feet. We had to climb down these little ladders and hang under the high steel and then just let go when the light above us turned on. And it was terrifying. <laughs> and uh, the rigging designer was the first one to do it. So that's a really good, uh, that, that's really good what you're doing, Barb. But I wanted to say one other thing um, from what you said about you educating yourself about the apparatus and the feeling of flying and how important it is for artists as well to receive an education about the way that they're, that the machines work. And um, again, going back to Zed, uh, Craig Reed was the first person I worked with with automation. And I'm really grateful that I had that time with him because he sat down and he gave me like a lesson in it. Uh, and he and I were able to put the Zed act together in three days. We'd had three hours in the morning where we just did automation and three hours at night where we tried to run whatever we had. And in three days, there was an act. It wasn't great, but there was an act and it went in the show. And from working with him and working with, uh, with Jordan Deacher and, and Scott Osgood and Andy and several other riggers over time, um, I've learned so much and learned how to communicate in a way that gets the job done faster and more efficiently. And I'm just, you know, it's amazing what you guys know and what you can do. And so when you share that information, it really empowers artists. And um, we're grateful for that. And on that note, I think we've reached the end of the day. This has been absolutely excellent. Um, thank you both, Ginger and Andy. And thank you all for your questions and your conversation. This has been terrific. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right. Thank you very much. Wonderful session today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Bill. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. And uh, I'm sure we'll run into each other down the road somewhere. Hope so. Take care, guys. Bye, Bye. Andrew. Thank you.